Hello and welcome back to the channel. In February and March of 2025, I traveled to Patagonia. Now, Patagonia is a region roughly defined as the lower part of South America. There aren't any defined borders. Most people, when they think of the word Patagonia, they think of Argentina. But about 10% of the region is in Chile, and that's where I headed. This is one of the most remote and unspoiled areas on Earth. One problem with places like that is they are very hard to get to. I live in New Hampshire. I had to fly from Boston to Houston, from Houston to Santiago, Chile. That was an 18-hour leg, and that was only about half the amount of travel time. The program is called Mission Patagonia. If anyone is interested in applying to this program, I will leave a link to the description below. I applied to it and was accepted. Now, if anybody here ever travels to Chile, I'm gonna give you an important piece of advice. When you first get into the country, some official is going to give you a piece of paper that looks like this. You cannot leave the country without it. And the problem is the person who gives you that piece of paper doesn't always tell you. And I've seen people lose that piece of paper. I've seen them throw it away in the trash minutes after getting that. Don't do that. It is enormous hassle to leave the country without that piece of paper. So we flew into Santiago, and I don't know if this made the North American news outlets, but there was a freak electrical outage that at its peak took out power to almost 90% of the country, including the entire city of Santiago, which is an enormous modern city of 6 to 8 million people. I was out filming street scenes, and I just thought, boy, rush hour is really bad here. But no, these are people trying to get home before it gets dark. We were in a hotel that had a generator as backup, and we were fine. We didn't really feel it, but it was an eerie feeling as sunset came, and this entire modern city was mostly dark. So we didn't even know if we were going to make it. The following morning, the power had been restored to most of the country, and we went to the airport, and here we are, smiling faces, all ready to go to Chilliway Island. Now, Chilliway Island is about 115 miles from top to bottom. It doesn't even feel like you're on an island. These are mostly fishermen, but tourism is starting to become a big industry here. I talked to some of the locals, and they have mixed feelings about all of this. One unique feature of Chilliway Island is that there are houses on pilings over the water. They refer to them as stilt houses. We stayed in one of the stilt houses. It was very well appointed and quite comfortable. We also taught at a local school. I've done this several times at rural schools, and it's always the emotional heart of the day. It rains almost every day here, and what the school did is they decided to reclaim some of the water that came onto the roof. It's pumped down into that building that you see there. It's filtered, and on most days they say they can supply most of the needs of the school just through this one system. I did a short presentation about how to find craters on the moon. The kids there couldn't have been more enthusiastic. Well, okay, it's time to head to Melamoyu, so let's get on the ferry. From Chilliway Island, we had to get here to the Melamoyu Nature Preserve, and this is the part of the trip that everybody was concerned about. The only way to get here is via an overnight ferry. The problem is this ferry doesn't leave until 1 a.m. It's an 8 to 10 hour journey by sea, depending on how many stops they make, and we had activities planned here the next morning. In other words, you had to try to sleep on the ferry. Now, we were told that this ferry was like a wide-body jet. It looks like a big airplane inside, and yes, it was. What I wasn't prepared for is how bright and loud and how much commotion there would be on this ferry. Take a look at this. Those television monitors were showing some Chilean reality singing competition, and people really seemed interested in it and wanted to see it. Adding to the problem, there was a semi that was supposed to load backwards onto the ferry, but it turns out the guy wasn't a very skilled driver, and it took him eight tries, what you're seeing here, to get it on board. It delayed the departure by over an hour. The ferry didn't leave until almost 2.30 a.m., putting us behind schedule. The lights were on inside for most of the evening. I think during this 10-hour journey, I slept maybe four hours on and off. But when I woke up, boy, was the scenery stunning. These fjords remind me of Scandinavia. As I was walking around on deck, I found our cohort, Sarah, staring at the sunrise and caught this candid picture of her.
And most people have remarked already about how clean the air smells. One comment I got was that the air smells dry somehow, especially compared to a place like Santiago where we just arrived from. So Melamoyu is a climate known as a cold rainforest because that's what it is all year round. Even though it's February here, which is the middle of summer, it's about 51 degrees here and it's not raining right now, but the forecast says it's going to rain every single day for the next week. So as an initial ice breaking exercise, they had us split into group and had us make one of these. This is an anchor that might be used by one of the indigenous peoples when they went out in their canoes. Now, the trick is they gave this thing to us in pieces and we had to figure out how to put it together. You may be able to see this. There's a rock in the middle here surrounded by this cage and the rope is a piece of twine that came from a tree. So let's take a look here. All of this can break at a moment's notice. Sinks to the bottom and it works. Looks like I passed. Now, Melamoyu is the four teats. Now, if you look at the picture there, there's only two of them left. The other two disappeared from volcanic activity. A couple of us are mountain climbers, and we asked if we could climb the thing, and we were all told that would be a very bad idea. There hasn't been a lot of documented people actually climbing that thing. There is no trail at the top, and the hazards are not very well marked. So there actually is a village of Melamoyu. It's, it's this way. Can't get there by here. You gotta get in another boat to go over there. As of right now, there's about a grand total of 15 residents over there. Back in the 1980s, the government decided it would be a good idea to settle this area, maybe try to get it to be something, and they offered land deals to people, who even sometimes giving away the land or selling it at a very low cost. Legend has it that close to 100 people took them up on that offer. When they came over on the ferry, some of them saw the condition of the land and they said, yeah, I don't think that's for us. And some of them never even left the boat and went all the way back to the mainland. Living in paradise does have its costs. Because of this region's reputation for cloudy skies, I didn't even think about bringing any astronomy gear. But I was also told the weather here can change from cloudy to clear and back again within a very short period of time. And it turns out we had one incredibly beautifully dark clear night here and I sat here and I don't even know the southern constellations all that well. I had to relearn everything all over again. But I didn't have any astrophotography gear with me. All I had is this Sony ZV-1. It's a vlogging camera that I'm using right now. It was never meant for astrophotography. I tried anyway. It didn't really work out. Luckily, there's someone here named Joel and he captured this image of Tiffany and I staring up at the night sky. You can see the Southern Milky Way, as well as the large and small Magellanic Clouds. Now the house where we're staying here is remarkably well equipped considering that we're in the middle of nowhere. There's about a dozen bunk bed rooms here, a nicely staffed kitchen, and a meeting room. But that's deceptive because there is nothing here. There's no full-time electricity, there's no cell service, everything is run on generators, and they turn off the electricity and the Wi-Fi at midnight to save power. A couple of us here are astronomy people, but most of the participants are biologists, environmental scientists, and oceanographers. Most of them have PhDs. I felt outmatched intellectually. We had numerous lectures, guided nature tours, hands-on activities, and even reenactments of local indigenous customs. I can't possibly remember all this stuff, but I took notes and I'll be writing them up for future use. We went whale watching. Here's me looking for the signature plumes when whales come up for air. The tour took about three hours, and while we didn't see any whales, we saw birds and other wildlife as well as these sea lions. These silly guys are just as curious about us as we are about them. You know, the trails back here are pretty well made, but it's easy to get lost back here. So one afternoon, we went in search of the Darwin frog. It's a species that lives here and is rapidly going extinct. See, the problem with the frog is it has a permeable skin and over time it's learned to reject a lot of the pollutants that come in modern society. But it turns out that there is a kind of fungus that's here. It's slowly working its way around the world. When this frog comes in contact with this fungus, it is 90% fatal to these frogs. So a lot of them are just disappearing all around the world. 
So you'll notice there's an orange pad behind me here. That's a disinfectant. Before you walk into the area of the preserve that has these frogs, we're supposed to step in it, and if there's any fungus on your feet, it will kill it before you get in there. Now I talked with one of the biologists here, and they concede that this is probably a losing battle. There's almost no way with this preserve this large that it's going to keep everything out, and it's probably going to go extinct at some point. So right now, scientists are working hard to study these frogs as much as they can so that we have information for future generations in case it does go extinct. Now, we were here all afternoon, and we saw a grand total of one of these. <laughs> they are green or they're brown. They're only about an inch long, so they blend into the background, and they're very hard to see. Pretty much the only way you see them is when they jump from one thing to the other, and they have eyes that are trained to see this. We couldn't see them at all. We saw one, and keep in mind, this is one of the most stable and populous areas for this frog. My birthday was on March 2nd, and the crew presented me with this cake. I still, to this day, have no idea how they got a cake out here in the middle of nowhere. A big shout out to the kitchen staff they hired, by the way. You were all amazing. It's a Chilean tradition that the recipient lean forward and take a bite out of the cake with no utensils. I'll spare you the video of that. As the trip came to a close, we had bonded over our shared experience. When you spend this much time together in close quarters, you get to know each other very well. We exchanged contact information and prepared to say goodbye. Wonderful and sad at the same time. You know, it's been pointed out that some of the longest lived things on the planet are conifer trees. They can live for thousands of years. I think it's appropriate that there are so many of them out here. We're out here in one of the most unspoiled areas on the planet and you know, is it going to stay that way? Well, you know, somebody said the other day that it's safe to drink the water here, and they do it all the time. Now, there's a chance that some animal is polluting it upstream, but they said it's actually pretty rare that that happens. It's safe to drink the water here. I'm telling you, back home in the United States, that would never be true. You cannot do that. But, you know, like the fungus with the frog, the E. coli and the other bacteria and contaminants around the rest of the freshwater will inevitably make its way down here, and they've admitted that that's probably true. So in that case, you know, would this be an unspoiled part of the world? Well, you know, I think it's going to be pretty hard to colonize this place, you know, just bringing power and the electrical grid and all of that down here. I don't know that's going to be cost effective, so I think it's safe from that, at least for a while. But, you know, I would say if you had a chance to go to a place like this, I'd say do it. That's how I see it, at least.